Denise Fitzgerald, Executive Editor of Commercial Property Executive. I'm pleased to be interviewing Dr. Mark Sandy, Chief Economist for Moody's Analytics. Mark is one of the most respected and quoted voices on the US economy, as well as the economics of real estate. Welcome back, Mark. Thanks for joining me. Thank you for having me. The last time we met, you were writing a book on the next recession. I think recession happened a lot sooner than people thought it would. Are we over the recession? If not, when will we be? The recession was very severe, but it was very short. It was um, really two months, March and April of last year. Uh, that's when we shut down much of the economy. The economy lost 22 million jobs. The unemployment rate surged to uh, officially measured 15%. It was probably higher than that. Uh, but by May, uh, the reopening began, uh, the economy started to grow, and uh, that marked the end of the recession. So it was a two month recession, uh, the shortest in economic history, but again, one of the most severe. I think uh, the only other recession that may have been more severe was back in uh, 1929, that uh, recession that ushered in the Great Depression of the 1930s. So. Um, you, you know, this this was in, this this recession was in rarefied territory on lots of levels, including how short it was. And how concerned are you about inflation, or what the Fed might do to control inflation? Uh, I mean, obviously, inflation is uh, has surged, uh, but uh, they you know I view it as as the Fed would say as transitory. It's, uh, it's uh, largely the result of the rapid reopening of the economy. Uh, demand surging and the supply side of the economy uh, taking a bit longer to kick into gear. You know, just turning on the lights and getting people in their seats and doing more work again in lots of different industries that were severely disrupted is, you know, that takes a little bit of time, you know, you know not a day or two, not even a week or two, not even a month or two, but at least a few quarters. And so it's demand and supply. You get a surge in demand, supply doesn't keep up, prices take off. Uh, also, also adding to that is just simply a normalization in prices. You had a number of industries, businesses that slashed prices uh, during the recession and, and uh, early on in the pandemic, hotels, rental cars, uh, airlines, and, and all they're doing is getting those prices back up to, to where they were pre-pandemic. And that's inflation, you know, prices going back up. So those dynamics are very transitory, temporary. So. Uh, by this time next year, I think inflation will uh, settle back in around the Federal Reserve's target of 2%. I'll say one other quick thing. Uh, before the pandemic, inflation was too low. Uh, you may remember uh, the Fed doing a lot of hand-wringing about inflation being below their 2% target. And, and now on the other side of the pandemic, in part because of the pandemic, but other factors, inflation will be above 2%. So, uh, but that's by design. That's a feature, not a bug. So underlying inflation will be higher going forward than it was certainly in the expansion after the financial crisis. Uh, but I don't view that as a problem. I, I view that as a you know, positive development. And one final thing I'll say is, you know, if I'm wrong, and obviously I could be wrong, um, mm -hmm. inflation turns out to be uh, higher than is comfortable, you know, say closer to 3% as opposed to 2 uh, the Fed knows how to solve that problem. And that is just raise interest rates more aggressively. Uh, they have a pretty uh, well uh, laid out a cookbook for addressing that particular issue. So I'm not worried about it. U.S. GDP growth is expected to be 6.5% this year and 3.5% next year. What's driving that growth? And what are some of the forces that will drag on the U.S. economy? At least for the next 18, 24 months, we've got a number of sources of growth. One is, uh, and this is why we're getting the outsized growth. One is just the reopening. You know, we're still bringing back online a lot of businesses, industries that were uh, curtailed during the pandemic. Uh, leisure, hospitality, restaurants, recreational activities, movie theaters, Broadway, travel. You know, that's all just normalizing. That generates a lot of growth uh, for at least the next uh, couple quarters, maybe over the next year. Second, a lot of fiscal support. Uh, you know, we've gotten a lot of fiscal um, uh, stimulus uh, during the pandemic. The American Rescue Plan was the latest uh, source of support. Uh, that's still driving a lot of growth. 
and I do expect another fiscal package that, uh, to get passed uh, by the Biden administration and Congress uh, in the next few months. And that'll provide a lot of uh, support to the econ economy going forward, really over the next uh, you know, decade. Get a lot of its infrastructure, social programs to help support labor force participation. So that'll help uh, support a lot of growth. And then finally, uh, we have a lot of pent up demand. Uh, a lot of people like you and I probably, I certainly me was sheltering in place. You know, we didn't spend uh, a lot of money. You know, I didn't go to restaurants, I didn't travel, I didn't go to ball games, didn't go to Broadway, didn't go to, you know, these are things I'd like to do and will do. And I have a lot of excess saving because I wasn't spending. So you mix a lot of pent up demand, a lot of excess saving. That's a lot of, that's a, a lot of spending and a lot of growth. Uh, longer run, uh, you know, once we get to the other side of the, you know, the normalization from going through the pandemic, and again, that's going to take the next year, 18 months, 24 months. I do think the American economy is on pretty solid fundamental ground. Um, you know, there's a lot of reason to be op optimistic about, um, you know, uh, uh, all the technological innovations that are, that we all know, but really haven't come to fruition yet from a business perspective. But they will, and I think that'll you know drive a lot of economic activity. I think we're in a pretty good spot. You can see I'm very optimistic, but there are things that could derail us. Uh, but I'll stop right there and let you ask your question before I, I go there. Do you think job growth will keep pace with the economy's expansion? I think we'll get a lot of jobs. Uh, I think we'll get all the jobs back we lost in the pandemic. You know, uh, by this time next year, or by the end of 2022. So we're still we lost 22 million jobs in March, April last year. We're still down 6.8 million. We'll get those back. And then by, I'd say by early 23, we'll have created enough jobs that we'll be back to what we consider to be full employment. So a sub 4% unemployment rate, participation rates will be back up. But, you know, after that, uh, it, it's going to be tough to generate a lot of uh, very strong job growth because labor supply is going to be a problem. Uh, the labor force isn't going to grow very quickly because working age population growth is you know, very weak, you know, boomers like me, we're retiring, the millennials, our kids are already in the workforce. So unless we change immigration laws to a significant way, in a significant way, a lot, a lot more immigrants into the country. And, uh, you know, in recent years, we've been going in the other direction, obviously. Uh, labor, uh, working age population is gonna come to a standstill. Labor force growth is gonna really slow. And by definition, you're not gonna be able to create as many jobs. And if we want, more growth, that either means we allow more immigration, we pass a legislation to support increased labor force participation, particularly by groups that have low participation rates, like, uh, like um, uh, low income households, uh, 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 people of color, that kind of, those kind of groups. Or we figure out how to generate uh, stronger productivity gains, going back to my point about uh, new technologies. But, uh, uh, our, our, one of our per, perennial economic problems going forward is going to be labor, just finding labor. I mean, remember back before the pandemic, the number one problem was uh, labor supply. We, businesses could not find people to fill the open job positions. The pandemic kind of derailed that, uh, but we're going to come right back to that in the not too distant future. It's looking more and more certain that a large percentage of white collar workers will not be returning to the office five days a week. What impact do you think this will have on the commercial real estate industry and the economy as a whole? This is a big deal. I think it's a remote work is a fundamental shift in the way we live and work. And it has enormous uh, implications for the economy and for real estate markets, so CRE, commercial real estate markets in particular. Um, you know, there'll be some swinging back of, the, of this work from uh, remote work uh, pendulum as the economy continues to reopen and office buildings welcome back, you know, workers like in New York City, you know, this is just now starting to happen. Uh, but there's no going back. Uh, I, I do think uh, businesses, remote work is a generally, not, not for every business, not for every industry, but generally a win-win for employers because it opens up the labor pool uh, for, for employers. I mean, not like I me mean, as an employer, I can hire people all over the world now. My, you know, the world's my, literally my oyster. I can, my, I, can, I can look for the best and the brightest all over the planet because they don't necessarily need to work in Westchester, PA. You know, they can work anywhere. Uh, and it's also good for employees, uh, workers, because they, you know, they like working. Many people like working from home. They don't like the long commutes. They want to live in places where 
uh, housing is more affordable, the cost of living is lower, taxes are lower, just a more pleasant kind of lifestyle, you know? And so this is a win-win. So in that, given that, I think this has, you know, uh, uh, this is a fundamental shift that's going to, there, there are, you know, a lot of niggling HR issues that need to be ironed out to really empower rem remote from work. Like, you know, I'm a Moody's employee. I worked in New York prior to the pandemic. I went down to Tampa during the pandemic. I want to stay in Tampa. Moody says, okay, fine, you can stay in Tampa, but should that person still be paid New York wages, right? I mean, that's, that's, a, that's an interesting question. I, I doubt Moody's would cut their wage, but you know, it might have impacts on future pay increases or bonuses or hiring decisions. And you know, what, what, if you think about that, this is a real problem for, a real issue for large urban centers where, where cost of living is high and commute times are long. New York is the poster child for that. I mean, I'll give you a statistic. This is based on looking at address changes of people in, from credit files. So we get all the credit files in the country every month and we can look at address changes for, uh, for, those, credit, for those people, to, uh, their, their credit files. It's anonymized, obviously. Since the pandemic hit, uh, almost 300,000 more people have moved from urban cores to suburbs, exurbs, and smaller cities than in the 15 month period prior to the pandemic. So the same 15 month period, 300,000 more. Of the 300,000 more, almost 100,000 came from New York al alone. So that gives you a sense of, you know, who, and it's Chicago, it's San Francisco, it's LA, to a lesser degree, it's Dallas, it's um, Houston, it's Miami, it's Washington DC, a little bit of Philadelphia mixed in there, Boston, you know, the big urban centers. And so, and that's where the, you know, a lot of the space is. That's a lot where a lot of CRE is located. A lot of office towers are located. So I think this is a problem or it's an issue. You got to, we're going to see an adjustment to this because there's going to be less absorption going forward of, of that space. Speaking of gateway cities, do you think they will come back or do you think we will continue this trend of spreading the wealth across the country? I'm not arguing that gateway cities are going to uh, decline. I'm not saying that you know, they're going to lose jobs or, or we're going to see negative absorption of space. I, I wouldn't go so far as to say that. But I will say that I think they, these ur large urban gateway cities will be diminished by, by all this. We, we talked about remote, re remote work. That's an obvious one. But the other thing to consider, at least over the, for the foreseeable future, is business travel. There's going to be, in my view, a lot less business travel. We're going to be doing this, you know, Zooming a lot more. Mm -hmm. And uh, we're just not going to be traveling nearly as much as business people. You know, tourists, that, that'll come back, although, you know, global tourism is going to take some time to come back because the pandemic is still going to be an issue for at least another year, two or three. But business travel, that's gonna, that, I don't see that coming back in any significant way for a long time. And that, you know, obviously also affects these large gateway globalized cities that, you know, rely very heavily on business travelers, you know, coming in for conventions and doing their business and, you know, uh, and uh, you know, coming along with the investment and trade. I, I just don't think that's going to happen to the same degree. So I think there's a lot of reasons to believe that large uh, global gateway cities, not, again, not that they will decline, not that employment will be lower in these areas than a decade ago. They just, it will be that employment's just not as high as it would have been without the pandemic. What is your long range outlook for other property types? I don't think I'm going to say anything that would be, you know, uh, outside the mainstream thought here. I, I don't think, but you can generally, uh, you know, I'm, uh, you know, I'm not upbeat about CR, commercial real estate. I think office is at, the, is at most risk, uh, particularly in big global gateway cities. Uh, I think uh, that uh, retail will continue to remain under pressure, brick and mortar retail, because of the increased online use, which is only put into hyperdrive. That was obviously happening before the pandemic to a significant degree, but it put on hyperdrive as a result of the pandemic. I think uh, also it, because you have a lot of uh, kind of uh, uh, apartment lifestyle rental in these big urban gateway cities, that will remain under pressure. You know, there'll be a bit of a positive bounce in the near term because you've got people coming back. That's part of the pendulum swinging back. But it's not going to come all the way back, and I think big you know, apartment, um, you know, towers and, and big gateway cities are going to be under pressure. You know, apartments in 
suburbs, exurbs, and you know, or more remote areas, that should be fine. They should benefit from uh, from uh, the, uh, the the remote, remote work, and it also should benefit from what are now extraordinarily high single-family house prices. And once you mix in, you know, a bit of a rise in mortgage rates, which I think are coming dead ahead, affordability for single-family housing will be hurt significantly, and that'll be in favor of rental. So rental is more of a mixed picture. And of course, then the most positive property, big property type would be industrial. You know, I think that will remain, you know, an area of, of growth just because that benefits from online demand. And I do think global trade, that will recover uh, and that will be, you know, a source of demand for uh, industrial warehouse space in, 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 in gateway cities. So uh, that kind of gives you, uh, you know, the, the kind of the, the panoply of, of different effects. But broadly speaking, I think the pandemic, a lot of the, the dynamics that the pandemic brought into relief were in place before the pandemic, but the pandemic brought these forces uh, that are, are going to weigh on absorption in, into clear relief, and I think they're going to be a, a, a weight on the CRE market in general. How do you think the tax picture is going to shake out for commercial real estate investors? I think tax rates are going up. I think we're going to see some rollback of the tax cuts that were part of the TCGA. So I do think large corporations will pay more in tax. Their top marginal rate probably will go back up. Uh, they're not going back to where they were pre-TCGA, which was 35%, they're currently 21. But if you told me they, you know, that lawmakers uh, settle in around 25%, I'd say that sounds about right to me. Um, um, uh, higher uh, taxation on uh, global earnings. Uh, I think that's likely one way or the other. Um, I also think tax rates are going to go up, be rolled back for high income, high net worth households. So higher marginal rates, uh, higher rate on capital gains. Uh, on 1031 exchanges, um, politically, I don't know if that actually gets done. I mean, in, in and I know there's a lot of hand wringing about it in the real estate markets, but if you if you actually do the arithmetic, and of course I'm looking at this from a 30,000 foot level, if you look at the tax revenue generated from 10, 1031 exchanges, divide by the market value of uh, real estate, and you think about you know some of the proposals of scaling back those exchange the tax benefits of those exchanges, you know the hit to CRE prices in aggregate. Probably are you know one two three percent something like that. Okay. Now, of course, that's an aggregate, so you know it depends on the property type, and for some investors, it's going to be much more significant than significant than that. So you know, I think that it hurts. It'll hurt. You'll feel it. You know, if you're an investor, uh, but you know, I, I think from a macroeconomic perspective, the impact is probably small. It's not going to have a big impact. Uh, but it, but again, politically, I don't that. That maybe I'm not trying to handicap that. I, I I don't I don't feel strongly about that. I can see that going either way, but uh, I do feel like like the odds are higher for some tax increases on large corporations on and on high income high net worth households. Here's another policy question: You and housing expert Jim Parrott recently wrote that affordable housing is a critical piece of economic infrastructure. But the infrastructure plan moving through Congress right now excludes housing and other social programs. Do you think this was a missed opportunity to resolve an immediate need? I think we're going to get two, likely two pieces of legislation. One is that bipartisan piece of legislation on kind of more traditional infrastructure that you mentioned. And that's probably going to be somewhere close to $600 billion in additional spending on you know, roads, bridges, you know, kind of traditional stuff, which is all good. We need all that. I think that's really important and valuable. But I also think we'll get a second package that will be passed uh, under reconciliation. So it would only require not only is, you know, only, only is, you know, it's, it's a big deal. It's going to be hard to do. But I do think they get, all they need is all 50 Democratic senators to vote for it. And I think they will get a package through under reconciliation excuse me, under reconciliation. And I think that package will include spending on uh, items to increase the supply of housing, particularly rental housing, housing trust fund, cap capital magnet fund, 
there might be some tax credits also, you know, light tech mm -hmm. is very proven to be a very effective way of incenting the private sector, private developers to build lower housing for lower income uh, households, rent rental housing. Uh, uh, new market tax credits also, you know, uh, have been proven to be quite effective in doing that. So I'd be, I, I, I think there's a reasonably high probability that we'll get a second package through reconciliation that'll include many things. It'll be a much larger package than the bipartisan bill, probably two, two and a half trillion, something like that over 10 years. And in that you will see a number of, uh, of spending and tax uh, breaks to support increased housing supply. I think it's absolutely critical to, uh, you know, helping people find uh, affordable housing but also important to the economy, particularly in big global gateway cities, because one of the key problems is uh, lower, uh, even middle income households just simply can't afford to live anywhere near where the work is. And that's a real problem for those big cities. Uh, you know, it goes to adding to the cost and labor supply and availability. And so if we want strong gateway cities, we, we need to figure out ways to provide more affordable housing uh, to lower income households. What parts of the bipartisan plan do you find most encouraging? I think we're in a good spot here, actually. I mean, I, if I were king for the day, I might do it a little bit differently, maybe in some cases more than a little bit. But, you know, broadly speaking, I think they're getting, they're doing the right things. They're saying, okay, look, uh, we have big needs here uh, on physical infrastructure and on human infrastructure. We've been under investing for decades. We need to invest. This is a really good time to invest because 10-year treasury yields are sitting at one and a half percent. Tell me another time in history when I've been able to, you know, uh, borrow at that. And in many cases, uh, you know, the money will be used for uh, things that will lift productivity growth and labor force participation, which are both key to long-term economic growth. Second, I'm going to make sure that the bulk of the benefits of the stronger economy that result from these pieces of legislation are going to accrue to low middle-income households because we have uh, seen the income and wealth distribution significantly skewed uh, away from lower and middle income households over the past 30 years. So we're going to pay for a lot of this by raising tax rates or rolling back tax cuts that were put in place. We're going to roll some of those back on high income households, high net worth households and large corporations. And finally, uh, I think, and of course we'll see, but my sense is, and this is certainly what Biden has proposed, that, uh, that the package uh, that proposals is, is actually paid for uh, on a static basis, uh, not in a 10 year budget horizon, but over a 15 year budget horizon, which I think is entirely appropriate because a lot of the spending that's being done here are for infrastructure, you know, one off investments that have a long life and should be amortized over long periods of time. So if you told me that we can pay for these packages of spending and increases in tax breaks uh, uh, over a 15 year period, I say, hey, that, that sounds pretty good to me, again, in the context of these low rates. So, you know, from a broad perspective, you know, without getting into the weeds of any individual proposal, which we can, I agree, there are some things I wouldn't do and I would change. But from the, you know, the, if you look at the broad contours of what's being proposed here, it's pretty good. Uh, I, I, I would vote for it uh, if I were, you know, uh, if I were in the Senate uh, uh, very quickly. There's growing unease about the Delta variant and uneven vaccination rates. In the case of another shutdown, how badly do you think this will hurt the U.S. economy's progress? You, you know, you asked me what could I bait up in the beginning, what could go wrong, and I didn't answer that question. This is definitely one of those things that could go wrong. I, it's, it's important to point out that the pandemic is still on. You know, it's not over, right? I mean, it's still raging in most parts of the world. And who says the Delta variant is the last of the variants? I mean, maybe the, you know we're we're lucky that Delta variant. Um, is, is still, uh, the, our vaccines can still uh, work against the Delta variant, but what about the next one, the next variant? I, I don't know. I mean, who knows? So it's almost unimaginable to think this pandemic could come back, but, you know, the pandemic itself is unimaginable. So I guess we need to imagine it and think about it. So I, I and I think that's a big deal. You know, I, I think the bar for shutting businesses down again and the economy down are, is very high. You know, the only way that would happen if our healthcare system was getting completely overwhelmed. And I, you know, the, it, I, I don't think that's likely, but even if we go back to sheltering in place, self-sheltering in place, you know, or wearing masks again, or closing schools, you know, that's gonna be really 
hard on people. I mean, people, like, you know, the collective psyche has really gone through a lot here. And I don't think it would take a lot to push it back under. So hopefully that's not what happens here. And hopefully, you know, technology keeps up, we we'll get more, uh, you know, our vaccines you know, stay ahead of this pandemic. And uh, we get to the other side without going backwards. But uh, that clearly is a risk. I hope so. Mark, thank you for your insights. They are always valuable. Thank you. Thank you.